Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless we now live in an isaiah 520 world where evil is good and good is evil where the sin of being a homosexual or transgender is openly celebrated and even glorified one of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of homosexuality that is sweeping the world today Jesus said he would return at a time when society parallels the days of Lot, as we read in Luke 17, 28 through 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1 through 5. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. Now you send your kid to school to learn the basics, math, English, history, science, but one school in Sutton, Massachusetts, is adding something new to their curriculum, drag. The school held an after-school drag workshop for middle schoolers, where a drag queen in a pink tutu and white lace underwear cartwheeled across students' desks. Now, when the parents found out about it, not too happy. One of the workshops was how to be a drag queen. And I've got to tell you, didn't set well with me. Tell me. As a grown woman sitting here before you, what life skills are we teaching these kids on how to be a drag queen? And with all due respect to the Sutton School Committee and the superintendent, please enlighten me. What is going on in our school? Just as in the days of Lot, not only is homosexuality widely accepted today, but it's being taught to our kids, just like in Sodom, as we read in verse 4. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Young is the Hebrew word nar, which means a boy from the age of infancy to adolescence. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6 and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus 
and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Authorities in Indonesia have issued a tsunami alert after multiple volcanic eruptions struck the country's North Sulawesi province. Until now, the, pl the pluming smoke from the disaster has forced at least 800 people out of their homes. Now, as for the country's volcano agency, Mount Ruang Volcano first erupted on Tuesday night and was followed by four more eruptions throughout Wednesday. Officials are now worried that part of the volcano might collapse into the sea, prompting a potential tsunami. In fact, inhabitants of the Kagulandans Island have been asked to evacuate over tsunami threats. The alert was initially placed at level 3 and has now been increased to level 4, which is the highest degree of threat on the four-tier alert system. People have been warned to stay safe from the potential ejection of rocks. Authorities have also increased the exclusion zone around the crater from 4 kilometers to 6 kilometers, asking people within the area to evacuate immediately. Now, as for Indonesia Geological Office, the volcanic threat at Ruang has risen over two earthquakes that lashed the island nation in recent weeks. And this is not the first time that Indonesia is reeling under a tsunami threat post-eruption. In 2018, the eruption of Anak Krakatau volcano caused a tsunami along the Sumatra and Java islands after parts of the mountain fell into the ocean. The incident claimed the lives of at least 430 people. Luke 21:11, And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. A magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake hit southern Japan on Wednesday night off the west coast of Shikoku Island. According to the Japan Meteorological Agency, the earthquake was initially reported as a magnitude 6.4 earthquake at a depth of 50 kilometers, but was later corrected to magnitude 6.6 .6 with a depth of 39 kilometers. Local broadcaster NHK reported that seven people were injured. No abnormalities have been detected at the Ikata nuclear plant in western Shikoku. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed, because nobody seems to be talking about it, but something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever, and earthquakes are going crazy, and nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world and the news headlines prove it. God in His grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day's signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Now to the latest round of dangerous storms in the Midwest. They swept through multiple states overnight, including Ohio, Missouri, and Michigan. Iowa's governor issued a disaster declaration. Officials here in Ferndale called yesterday evening's storm, quote, quick, but unbelievably wild. Wind speeds here topped 70 miles per hour, ripping parts of the roof off of this restaurant and this tire shop behind me. And then look at this, tossing huge chunks of it onto these cars below. And as we know, as you said, this is the latest chapter in a week of widespread severe weather. This morning, the trail of damage from severe spring weather is growing after another line of violent storms packing strong winds and reported tornadoes ripped through multiple states across the Midwest, uprooting trees, flipping cars and leveling homes. 
This store in Ohio hit hard after winds Wednesday night ripped off a chunk of its roof. But I want to get down. This video taken from inside a post office gives a first hand glimpse at the strength of the dangerous gusts. Lost part of our tree. Crews are now working around the clock as homes are in desperate need of repair and power lines are impacted with more than two dozen tornadoes reported in at least five states since Monday. That's a tornado. The twisters ripping across the Midwest, leaving stunning scenes of disruption. It's blown up. I mean, it's no other way to say it. It's blown up. Iowa's governor declaring a disaster in six counties. It's heart-wrenching. But get this, we've already had this year more than 300 reported tornadoes across 26 states, and May next month is historically the busiest for tornadoes nationwide. The scenes in Soak Dubai tonight look apocalyptic. Roads turned into rivers, trees barely still standing as wind sends debris flying. The tarmac flooded at Dubai International Airport, the second busiest in the world. Imagine being a passenger on this plane, battling rising waters, seeing this out your window. For hours, flights were halted as stranded passengers piled up. Tonight, Dubai Airport telling passengers don't show up unless you've confirmed your flight's still leaving. There are hundreds and thousands of other passengers just like me in this airport who have been waiting for 10 hours, 16 hours. In 24 hours, Dubai drenched with more rain than the city usually gets in nearly two years, shattering records in a desert metropolis known for being hot and dry. Since the UAE started keeping track of rainfall in 1949, it's never seen anything like this. So this is not a time lapse, this is real. I've never seen this much lightning in my life before. This is crazy. The extreme rainfall disrupting life across the region. Private schools closed and government workers sent home, with many roads impassable. A cat clinging to a car in water as high as the headlights, saved by a rescuer in a boat. This historic rain has turned deadly. At least one man killed in Dubai when his car was swept away. While in neighboring Oman, authorities say at least 18 were killed in flash flooding. Dozens more rescued, some by helicopter. And in nearby Pakistan, the death toll has now surpassed 60, officials say. In the UAE, the unprecedented rain is raising concerns about something called cloud seeding, which the UAE has been doing for years. Cloud seeding is an attempt um, to get more water out of clouds. This is largely by making the droplets larger and more able to survive. Cloud seeding uses airplanes to disperse chemicals like silver iodine inside clouds to give moisture something to cling to. Badly needed in deserts like the Gulf, but not not when it falls this fast. The UAE's National Center of Meteorology says no cloud seeding took place during this rainfall, but doesn't deny cloud seeding flights took place in the days before. But weather experts say it was unlikely a factor, given how the whole region was inundated with rain. The weather system that produced the rain um, in Dubai is over hundreds of kilometers, really very many organized thunderstorms. There's a real mismatch between what you might do in a local way with cloud seeding and this regional rainfall we've seen over a really wide area. Tonight, Dubai is cleaning up from the chaos and bracing for more extreme weather to come. Across the globe, extreme weather events are becoming more common due to climate change, with the warmer atmosphere soaking up moisture and then dumping it in massive storms like the ones in Dubai. On a hospital bed in Niger, a 96-year-old woman lies motionless, attached to a drip. She is one of possibly thousands of victims of West Africa's worst heat wave in living memory. That extreme weather was a once in a 200 year event, a report said on Thursday, driven by man made climate change and likely to become much more frequent. In late March and early April, many West African countries were gripped by days and nights of temperatures above 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 Celsius. The severity of the heat wave led climate scientists from World Weather Attribution to conduct a rapid analysis. It concluded that the temperatures would not have been reached if industry had not warmed the planet by burning fossil fuels and other activities. And according to Claire Barnes, a WWA statistician, the situation is likely to get worse. At two degrees of warming, which is the kind of threshold that we often look at for future temperatures, um, we would expect to see heat waves like this maybe 10 times more frequently. So potentially up to 20 times a year for these really extreme 
uh, temperatures. So it's something that people are going to have to adapt to and learn to live with, unfortunately. At least 100 people have died in the capital Bamako. The figure could be much higher elsewhere in Mali. Meteorologists measured a temperature of 48.5 degrees Celsius in one town on April the 4th. That's the highest ever recorded on the African continent. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. More than one million hectares of maize have been destroyed by the worst drought to hit Zambia in decades. The United Nations El Nino Response Coordinator has been on the ground to assess the magnitude of the crisis. At the moment, we're looking at six million people that will probably require aid over the coming months. The food shortages are expected to spur price increases, and the low rainfall has reduced hydropower generation, which has caused electricity cuts, leaving Zambia facing both humanitarian and economic problems. The El Nino-induced drought has slashed harvests across the southern African region. Malawi and Zimbabwe have also declared national disasters and appealed for international support which is needed now. With all the crises in the world that are urgent and pressing, like Gaza, Sudan, uh, Ukraine, we need to make sure that the world does not forget that there is a looming crisis here. And the governments have made a call for action themselves, um, and we need to heed and support that, or it will get worse. Much of the southern African region continues to experience the kinds and frequency of extreme weather which are impacting lives in different ways. Much of it is down to climate change, but these El Nino weather events are also no longer as predictable as scientists thought. The food shortages are expected to spur price increases. We are fast approaching a time known as the Tribulation, that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. A show of military force in Iran during its annual Army Day celebrations. The goal? To show the nation's military preparedness. But the event this year comes just days after Iran launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, for whose leaders the president had this warning. If our action was to be large-scale, then nothing would be left of the Zionist regime. Their false grandeur collapsed in operation. Any attack on our soil will be dealt with fiercely and severely. Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israel on Saturday. 
in response to the attack on its consulate section in Damascus on April 1st, which killed seven members of the Revolutionary Guards. The operation dubbed True Promise by the military is being viewed here as a historic win, but concerns about what comes next has put the country on high alert. If Israel targets a site in Iran that is not that sensitive, for example, somewhere close to the border, since Iran is not looking for war, then in this case, Iran could respond to its proxies. But if Israel attacks any sensitive sites, I think Iran will respond on a larger scale, and even its allies like U.S. interests could be targeted in the region. As Iranian officials wait for Israel to respond, they continue to highlight their military strengths. The attack on Israel has shown that Iran's leaders are willing to follow through on their threats. While daily life goes on without any major disruption, the historic tensions have put people on edge, fearing that an attack here could have far-reaching consequences. Complete annihilation, that's what Iran is threatening, will happen to Israel if it attacks their soil. Israel's response, we will be ready. Speculation is that retaliation for Iran's massive attack may not happen until after the upcoming Passover holiday. Meanwhile, as CBN's Julie Stahl reports, the war of words continues. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says world leaders want the Jewish state to go easy in striking back at Iran after it attacked with more than 300 drones and missiles. But I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend and itself. Wednesday, Iran's president warned Israel will face a massive and harsh response for any invasion of its territory, threatening, quote, the complete annihilation of the Zionist regime. Israel says it will be ready. We are preparing ourselves for the next time, debriefing the mission and seeing how could we prepare ourselves for the, for the next attack, uh, if it would uh, come. After Israel's air defense forces destroyed 99 percent of incoming drones and missiles, Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein tells CBN News there's only one way to explain its tremendous success. We were all witness to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. I think it's going to take a little while for the, the full effect of it, for the facts to set in. Israel is now facing another threat on the diplomatic front. Friday, the U.N. Security Council will hold a vote on a Palestinian request for full membership. That move, which could lead to recognition of a Palestinian state, is expected to be blocked by the U.S. We are living in consequential times, and there is no time to waste. U.S. warships remain on high alert in the eastern Mediterranean. Iran reportedly has pulled many of its Revolutionary Guard Corps forces out of Syria, fearing Israeli retaliation for Saturday's missile assault. Lufthansa has canceled flights to Tehran until April 30th. We will continue to stand ready to protect our troops in the region and to support the defense of Israel. Whether or not Israel responds is, a, is an Israeli decision. We don't want to see a wider regional conflict. The USS Arleigh Burke and USS Kearney remain poised to defend U.S. bases across the region. In the Red Sea, U.S. Navy warships and commercial shipping have fended off 130 direct attacks from the Iran-backed Houthis in the past six months. We currently have approaching $1 billion in munitions that we have uh, need to replenish. So therefore, the over $2 billion that's uh, provided for in the supplemental is, is direly critical. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin urged Congress to pass the military aid supplemental funding requests for Israel and Ukraine. Putin won't stop uh, it with Ukraine. I mean, I think he will continue to seek to pull back in some of those countries that were in the former Soviet Union. The secretary praised CENTCOM commander General Eric Carrilla, who oversaw Saturday night's response. That doesn't happen at the 11th hour. That happens because countries are working together. The commander of Iran's Air Force says his forces are ready to launch using Soviet Sukhoi-24 bombers against Israel, an attempt to deter Israel from retaliating after half of Iran's ballistic missiles, most of its current stockpile, failed on the launch pad or in flight last weekend. The rest were shot down. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. 
And it shall happen in that day, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 The burden against Damascus Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9 in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34-37 The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end-time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken, 
Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin the infamous Gog of Magog that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, 
you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.